Hey, thanks for being here. My name is Arrow. This is PodFest 19. Three back-to-back conversations with real people we know either through entertainment, politics, science, medical, or just by helping another creative out. They're played back-to-back. I've learned that podcast listening isn't always about a four-minute song. The lyrics that we share in the everyday world make being a part of this new age of content incredibly special, and these guests always bring their story. PodFest 19 features my 2021 conversation with actor Brian Muller from Bridge and Tunnel on Epics. And then we're going to jump into a very rare moment with David Stanley, his book, My Brother Elvis. Yeah, as in Elvis Presley. And we'll wrap things up with an empowering journey with music legend Desmond Child, The Unopened Curtain. This is PodFest. Good morning, Brian. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? Fantastic. you got to be so proud of yourself for doing this show on Epics, Bridge, and Tunnel. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that really, I'll tell you the first thing that I felt when I watched it, togetherness. And because in, in this COVID day, <laughs> we're, we're, we don't have togetherness, but you guys are promoting it. Yeah, thank you. I, I agree. It's got a connection um, to it. I mean, it's it's got and and it's like a solid connection of something. And I'm I'm so excited to ask you about that. What did you feel on your side of the flat screen versus our side? You know, when I first read the script, it just felt so familiar to yeah. me. I mean, first off, I'm from I'm born and raised in New York, and um, so the, just the kind of the 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 location of it, the setting of it. Um, felt immediately connected. You know, my whole family's from New York too, so the accent just felt like, oh, I'm just gonna, you know, <laughs> my whole, you know, so so much of my extended family, you know, talks in thick New York accents. And but then most, you know, it, it, the, the show's set in 1980. But you know, I mean, everyone says it, but you know, there's just there's th- there's certain things that are just universal, and and and, um, and the just the dynamic of the friend group. Um, of people that have known each other for their entire lives. You know, one of the nice things about growing up in New York is that people kind of, uh, you know, they always come back to New York. Yeah. <laughs> Often places, you know, I have so many friends where, you know, it's like, yeah, I don't keep in touch with too many people from my hometown because, you know, so many of us left. But, you know, it's, it's I'm, I'm still really close with many of my friends from growing up. Um, and just with that dynamic of kind of, you know, the guys giving, you know, ribbing each other and, you know, uh, you know, insulting each other, but at the end of the day, they're just there's it's this degree of loyalty where they would you know step in front of a step in front of a truck for you. You know, they'd walk into traffic for you, and uh, also just like at this transition period at this show, you know, the main six characters of us, you know, this group of friends, they're all about to kind of step into their adult lives and start this new chapter, and how kind of exciting but also terrifying that can be and i know personally you know that that period of after i graduated from college and trying to step into being a professional actor was was really a difficult one and if it had not been for the kind of people that have known me my whole life it would have been that much harder you know you bring up a very interesting point in in my notes i put down that there's a subliminal message here for all people who watch bridge and tunnel and that is because i feel like that this whole nation has gone back to college and that in the next weeks ahead we're going to be turned (laughs) loose and let go and so when i watch you guys take those steps out there uh, as as actors i'm going holy crap that's going to be all of us we're all going to be taking that first step forward into a new adulthood you know that's a great point. You know, it's, it's so many people, so many friends of mine who are are have been living with their parents for the past, you know, since March for the past eight months or however long it's been, and uh, you know this <laughs> this show takes place. A lot of you know these kids have just graduated from college and they're back home. They're back underneath their parents' roof, and I think they're just rearing to go. They're like, get me out of here, which is how we all kind of. That's how we all feel right now. I feel like the entire country just feel like we're like horses in a stable, just kind of like hitting our head being like, can you let me free, please? Can you let me run? <laughs> so true. We're talking about Bridge and Tunnel on Epics. So, man, you get the cool name, man, Pags. I mean, are people coming up to you going, yo, That's Pags, right. what's up, man? What's going on, Pags? What's happening? Yeah. <laughs> Certainly, while we were on set, with people, I, I started responding very quickly to PAG. It, it fit. It fit pretty quickly. You know, it's nice to have. You know, having that 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 nickname. Um, you know, when I was, you know, wh- like my friends that call me by my last name, I have friends that call me Muller, and I always loved that. You know, it's like, yo, Muller, what are you doing? That's I always, it. I always, uh, I always like when someone kind of gives you a name. Um, 
gives you that nickname, which is such a classic. I mean, it's such a classic New York thing yeah. of being like, you know, Nick Pagnetti. Of course, it's Pag. What do you mean? It's Pag. Don't be here. I could just see you guys up there, one of those one of those high schools that are in right over there by the meat district and stuff like that playing basketball. Pags, over here, man. Come on. Throw me the ball. It, 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 exactly. Exactly. So now to work with Ed Burns, this man is such a visionary. I mean, it's not just about words. It's about painting a picture for the people that are watching it. Totally. Yeah, man, he's amazing. Um, you know, Ed's really carved out such an amazing career for himself. And it's, and it's all, you know, it, it all stems from his writing and his directing mm-hmm. and, and his vision for his stories. Um, you know, I, you know, the first time I saw him was in, First time I saw him was, uh, you know, in Saving Private Ryan, but what was the precursor to that was him writing and directing his own stuff, which you don't, you know, when, and then as I've watched his work, um, just, you know, it's interesting, I was talking about this, you know, that, you know, the indie, you know, he's made a, a career for himself making indie movies, and when you think about indie movies, you don't necessarily, the first thing you don't think is blue collar, yep. and, um, you know, Ed, Ed kind of has carved this, this space for himself where he makes blue, uh, like indie movies about blue collar um, communities and people. And I think that's a really kind of unique thing. And that's something that's so special about him. And it was such a, such a joy to kind of, you know, be in his canon of work. And especially as a, as a New Yorker and feeling like this is a guy, you know, a, 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 I moved to uh, Los Angeles after I graduated and uh, from college speaking of the transition periods being difficult <laughs> yeah. my, my year in LA was really, really hard. I mean, that was like a, serious culture shock and uh, I kind of moved back to New York with my tail between my legs <laughs> and the city New York is really kind of uh, it's taken care of me and it's really been you know the gruffness of it you know so I remember when I was living in Los Angeles and pe- everyone was just like nice to me in the grocery store I thought well what's what's wrong with these people <laughs> you know when I asked you know when I asked like where's the <laughs> you know when I asked like you know, where's the bread? What, what aisle is the bread section? Like, you should look at me as if you hate me. Yeah, that's that's, that's the appropriate <laughs> way to kind of, uh, that makes me feel comfortable. When they when someone's so happy to help you in a grocery store, it really freaked me out. So, you know, there's that element of things, which, which to friends of mine doesn't make sense. They're like, what do you mean? He was so nice. I'm like, no, no, no there's something wrong with that guy. Like, why, why was he so happy to help us? <laughs> um, and Ed kind of, uh, Ed kind of gives, Ed kind of, you know, gives voice to 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 <laughs> the, those east us east coast people who kind of uh you know say tell you to screw go screw yourself and uh you know but they also <laughs> the, the, there's that love there too <laughs> so did you have a moment out there in la where you almost fell in love with the dodgers giving up on the yankees or the mets you know it's been i'm a mets jets and Nick fan. So it's been a tough, um, it's been a tough life for me really. But, um, no, I, you know, I, I went to a couple Dodgers games and I enjoyed it, but, uh, you know what I did do? I went to, uh, at some point, I went to an LAFC game. Wow. And uh, uh, I went to a soccer game, and that was really, that was a that was a blast. That was really fun. But, no, I have not given up on my Knicks. My Knicks are 7 and 8 this year. Um, hopefully making the playoffs. I've got money on them making the playoffs. <laughs> yeah. And uh, my Mets, the Mets have a new owner, so I'm hoping the Mets can can really make use of our bull, of, our, of our bullpen, our pitching pitching staff. So I've, I've got high hope. The Jets have a new head coach, so I'm I'm, I'm excited about the the future of New York sports. Hopefully, it'll be a better. Hopefully, the 2020s will be better than uh, the 90s and the 2000s. Well, you've got a winning season with Bridge and Tunnel, dude. I really honestly believe that this is going to be the big binge watch. I mean, because when people discover it, and they're going to discover it day by day by day. But, I mean, what you guys are doing with Epics is you, you are carving out your own version of life on that screen. Yeah, well, I'm, uh, thanks so much. You know, I, I just, you know, it's, such, it's been such a tough year, and um, I, we just want to give people something – that they can enjoy and smile at and you know just uh we're not trying to we're not trying to you know screw with your head we're just trying to give you something nice and watch watch uh uh something that feels familiar and also will hopefully you know pull your heartstrings and uh make you feel like life's worth living because you know these past year there's been you know it's been dark days for everyone yep yep well congratulations on the show please come back anytime the door is always going to be open for you brian Thank you so much. You have Appreciate a, it. You have a brilliant day, okay, Pags? All right. All right, you too. <laughs> Bye, guys.
Good morning, David. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? Doing very well. You know, as as much as I want to talk about how incredible Elvis is, I want to talk about you, David, because there's there's so much about you that we don't know about that because you have been shaped, you have been a leader all the way, all the way, and I just want to know about you. Well, that's very kind of you. I'm kind of a simple man that lives in the beautiful state of California in San Diego, enjoying the sunshine. I'm a, I'm a, a speaker. I've been a speaker since 1980. I travel throughout the United States, motivation, inspiration. I am a, um, I'm an advocate on prescription drug abuse in America today, or the world for that matter. Uh, I wrote my brother Elvis the final years to remind the world that if it could happen to him, it can happen to anybody. Um, I have a production company in Los Angeles in Nashville called Impello Entertainment. We do book publishing, films, television, music publishing. Um, you know, I, and I love life, so I appreciate you asking. I'm not used to somebody asking me about myself. Well, it's because you're, you're very inspiring, and the fact that you that you have dedicated your life a to go out and motivate people, and b that that you're you're putting awareness out there about drug addiction, dude. That that says a lot about you and how you were brought up. Well, I appreciate that. You know, I, I was raised by Elvis Presley, stepbrother to Elvis Presley. My mom married his widowed father in 1960. I moved into Graceland Mansion. There was a guy named Elvis Presley who became the father figure, the mentor of my life. And I did learn from Elvis, if you have a gift, use it. If God, because he, he believed that God gave everybody a gift. And he said, use it. And he encouraged me to always use the gift. It took me a long time to find out what my gift was as a speaker, as a motivator, as somebody that could inspire. I'm very humbled by that, but... The story that Elvis Presley gave me, the legacy that he left in, in me as, as his stepbrother and providing a platform to communicate my objectives to a, to a public is a gift that I got from him. Unfortunately, that gift cost him his life. I mean, Elvis's prescription drug abuse is uh, well known by now. Uh, he took a lot of medications in the last several years of his life. Those medications cost him his life at 42 years old, very young. Uh, when I was in Elvis's bathroom that day, he died 39 years ago yesterday and cradled in me and him in my arms. I realized if I don't get my life together, I'm next. And so I was spared and I was able to overcome the negative ideologies of my rock and roll past. I was able to lick the addiction, so to say. And as a result, I began to share those stories in 1980 in churches and high schools and colleges and anywhere I could. And that's where I cut my teeth on my speaking career. And then I realized that I had a story. I had a story to tell. Everybody can relate to Elvis Presley. Everybody loves Elvis, and they should. Phenomenal rock and roll star, phenomenal talent, entertainer, loving, caring, giving individual. But unfortunately, as much as we loved him, we lost him in a very bizarre way. And that bizarre way is my platform and within the structure of my brother Elvis, the final years. If one can read that, a rock and roll story that I feel is entertaining and crazy, like, wow, what was life like on the road with Elvis Presley? But yet, at the same time, the the tragic ending can be a reminder to all of us that nobody's above reproach. You know, anything it could happen to anybody. It could happen to Elvis. It could happen to anyone. So that's what I do. That's what I've dedicated my life to. That's what the book is about. Um, it's 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 also a fun book. I mean, it's it's not a it's not all dark. But obviously, we know the ending. It's like watching the movie Titanic. We know it's going to go down. But at the same time, we can we can be entertained, learn some history. Uh, perhaps overcome a, uh, something in your personal life through the pages of the book and be inspired to go, hey, David woke up one day, and if I'm going down that path, I can wake up as well. Now, you know so how what I'm all you, you know how God works. He puts you in places so that he can use you as a tool for the future. Do you, do you feel that that's happened to you? Because it sure sounds like it, sir. I believe that God gave me a testimony. Yes. I believe that I was in Elvis' life, and I believe the reason I was in Elvis' life is to have this conversation with people like you right now. And to communicate a message, I believe that wholeheartedly. I'm a, I am a believer. I mean, I, I mean, Elvis was a believer. You know, he again, he says, God gives you a gift. If there's a sin in the world, the biggest sin in the world is to have a gift and not use it. And so, you know, I try my best to, to honor my faith and honor the uh, honor God and uh, communicate. You know, what God has given me in the platform to give it from. What, what was that moment like for you to become that motivational speaker? Because we all know, I, I've been up there on that stage talking outward. That That's not a moment of ego. That's You're pouring your soul and energy out to a group of people, but not always do they give it back. What is it like for you to be in that moment? Well, when I, when I first did it, I was at a church, and the guy said, share your testimony. I said, what's a testimony? <laughs> I didn't know what it was. He said, share your story. And I stood up and my knees were knocking and my voice was cracking and all I could do is just share 
what had happened to me. I had gone from the, quote, king of rock and roll to the king of kings. I mean, there's no other way to put it. That's what happened to me. And that's how I overcame a lot of the addictions in my life. And as I shared, I began to realize that I had the ability to communicate, and I began to see the results. People coming to me, you changed my life. You touched my life. I, my, I went in a different direction. I, you know, you, you woke me up. And, I, you know, I began to, you know, go, wait a minute, I have something here with this message and the ability to deliver it and to get back those letters. And to, even to this day, you know, I was speaking back in the 80s and 90s, I still get letters. Thank you for changing my life. Thank you for reminding me and motivating me. Um, it's, you know, speaking's not for everyone. I, the last thing in the world I thought I'd ever be as a speaker. Now, I'm an author a speaker, and I have an entertainment company. We do television, and we do films, and we do book publishing and music publishing. But my primary life goal or mission is to speak, communicate, motivate without hesitation to inspire people to embrace their authentic selves, embrace the gift that God has given you and be the best you can be and all that he's got for you. Don't you love those moments where you're in a, an, in, even in a Southern church and, and you send out that one sentence that, that you, you put together and all of a sudden people are going, amen, oh my, and, and they're raising their arms and you can feel it in that moment. Well, you can feel the spirit. You know, it's you know, you're, you know, you you're, you know. Every time I take the platform, I realize it could be for the last time, and I act like it was my first time. And it's an opportunity to be a, a, a voice. You're 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 sharing something that's you know you know being driven through you by the spirit itself. It's a phenomenal moment. I don't speak in as many churches as I used to. I mean, I used to speak in good grief thousands of churches, but I took it to corporations and now associations. Um, and I mean, even no matter where I'm at, no matter if it's in a church or if I'm in a with, with a major corporation, I always inject my faith. And people have a tendency to listen when you're when you're motivated by the Spirit. There's no other way to put it. I want to say I appreciate you asking these questions. I appreciate your faith and your courage to communicate it. Uh, that's what we need more of. Yeah, we do need more leaders in this world. We need we need people like yourself to be able to go up to an American business and say, I know that you're bogged down by all the work that's on your shoulders, but you know what? I know a way that's going to help free you because you know what's happening, David. We're getting bogged down at work and we're going home and we're taking those prescription drugs to escape. That You, you just nailed it right on the head. That's exactly what's happening. It's nothing more than a, a Band-Aid, okay? It's a temporary thing of relief, but that relief button is going to get worse and worse and worse until the point you're going to wake up addicted. And then once you get there, you lose your job, you lose your family, you lose your life. You're exactly right. We've, we've got to inject faith and hope and, and, and opportunity, and there's always a way. There's another way besides self-destructive to enjoy life. And, you know, embracing your faith, no matter what that faith is, it doesn't have to be mine or somebody else's, but instead of looking at, look up and draw from that faith, and, and I think you'll do a lot better off in your life. Don't in you, fact, I know you will. Don't you see yourself as being a modern-day collaborator in the way that you're saying, look, here are the lyrics to my personal song. Why don't you sing with me so that you can create your own music? Exactly. Everybody has their own voice. And, and God's given each and every one of us our own melody, our own tune, and our own story. And to share with each other and love one another and do it that way, it works for me, is all I can say. And it has sustained and work. I mean, and I came from a crazy background. When I was 17, 18, 19 years old, I was touring with the king of rock and roll. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll at the highest level. There's not a whole lot that I haven't experienced in my life growing up with Elvis Presley. So I've seen the world and everything in it, but, you know, I've made a choice to embrace my faith and communicate that. And it's brought peace and sustained joy in my life ever since. I'll, I'll tell you what, that, that's one of those moments that everybody remembers when the news hit. And, and I remember going up into my homemade radio station in Billings, Montana, and playing the song that Elvis had out at that time, which was Way Down. Way oh down. I mean, but, but it was such yeah, a I moment. That. Yeah, and I and no. even, even in these moments, it, 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 it doesn't erase from your body. But David, you're giving us a tool here that can help erase the pain from our lives so that we can grow forward. Well, you know, I mean, well, thank you. I'm, I'm doing my best. You know, and I wrote my brother Elvis again for people to read what was it like. You know, a lot of people are just, what happened to Elvis Presley? What the heck happened? The guy's 42 years old. He's got the world and everything in it. How could this happen? And in the pages of the book, My Brother Elvis, you find out in a very, very honest, loving, caring way. It's a story of, you know, of a, a little brother watching a big brother admiring the big brother, wanting to be like the big brother, then watching the big brother self-destruct. And the helplessness that I had, the only regret I have, and I don't have any really, but because I'm, I'm, I'm very happy where I'm at, but it's 
somebody says, what would you do different? What, if you had one thing you could do now, what would it be? Talk to Elvis now at my age, at where I'm at. And, you know, because back then I'm 17, 18, 19, 20 years old. I'm a kid. I now, you know, when I was a child, I thought I was a child and I spoke as a child, but when I became a man, I put childish things away. I'd like to communicate with you from a different perspective and say, hey, these things you taught me can work for you too. I, I lived in my brother's shadow in my entire life. That's all I've been there. I, I'd like to know how you found the light and, and, the, and the warmth for your vine to create the fruit that you have. Where along the line did you realize that, wait a second, I, I'm David. I, I, I'm, you know, I'm Elvis's stepbrother, but I'm still David. I think it's when I started speaking and, and, and again, going back to the results of getting the letters and hearing the people say, you know, you changed my life or thank you or an email or a text or, you know, even back then before the social media campaigns were around, you'd get a letter from somebody and you realize, you know, I mean, Elvis was a phenomenal entertainer and had his gift. Elvis wasn't a speaker. And I've always said, I wish I could do something as good as Elvis did what he did. And I don't think I'm as good as Elvis was at anything, but... That's just the way I was brought up. I'm hum- very humbled about the things that I do have. But I became a speaker, a communicator, and I had a gift. And once I found that voice and found that gift, which we all have, and then that's what made the difference to step out and admire and love and think there's some great music and entertainers and actors and great things, that uh, legends and legacies that are left behind that you can really wear. But at the same time, I'm very comfortable with the shadow I've come from and stepped into my own life to be able to communicate the way I do and honor my God the way I do. And that's the only reason I do it is because I give glory to God on everything I do. I love your heart. David, you can come back to this show anytime you want to, sir. I appreciate that so much. I appreciate the interview. You bet. You enjoy your day today, okay, sir? Good morning, Desmond. How are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing great. This has got to be the, a fa- the coffee. The coffee finally kicked in. <laughs> oh, so I'm ready to talk to you really fast. <laughs> <laughs> this has got to be a great moment in your life because you get to finally step through and share the stories. We've all heard the songs before, but we've never really got gotten to know you. I know. You know, it's like I'm the man behind the curtain, but they forgot to open the curtain. <laughs> it's it's an incredible, unique piece of, of American music history, because one of the things that I've, I put so much love in, in, in the iHeartRadio channel that I have is the fact that people need to know the story. And for you to even write the book and to release Desmond Child Live is just mind blowing in creating the story for the next generation. Well, I, I just love it, you know, because I, I go to a Bon Jovi concert and you'll see you know, people there with white hair, you know, and then little kids like on, on their parents' shoulders. And they're there like all night waiting to hear Living on a Prayer, which is usually the very last song. So it gives me some, so much pleasure to see so many generations of people enjoy the, the music I've co-created with, with these wonderful bands and, and artists. Did you ever feel like you were part of the band? Because I, Bruce Geich is, is my, my wife's ex-husband who's out of Nashville, and he said, I didn't want any part of a band. I just, I just wanted the money, not the fame. Well, I never have done things for money because, you know, I, I know that's, I'm a true artist. I, I, I mean, it, it really isn't for me to say if I'm a true artist. Somebody else would have to say that, actually. But I, I, I go about my life as that. So I don't think I would have had success had I start, started thinking about riding a hit. It's like, you know, thinking about riding a bike, you know, it's like you just fall off. <laughs> no. So I have a process. And so that's how, you know, I've, I've gone about it. And, I, and I'm there to serve the artists I'm working with to bring out their, their stories and help them to shape, you know, the future of their music and not look back at their past hits. Listeners need to understand that Desmond Child Live, what you have done with these songs, they're so authentic in the way of, we know what, you know, what, how the, what the bands did with it, and you come in there and you put your style on it, and you're going, oh my God, the artist totally respected the way you wanted these songs to be produced. Well, um, you know, some songs just beckon, you know, to be a certain way, like I hate myself for loving you. It's hard not to do it, kind of like a, a bit like, you know, the way Joan did, but I have this fantastic sing- singer, uh, Tony Award winning Lena Hall, and she just like, she's like a Mick Jagger on, you know, like a female <laughs> Mick Jagger, and she just like went crazy with the song. And so um, it was it was so much fun uh, putting all my friends together 
and um, you know, going back to my roots, which is the New York Cabaret. Wouldn't and you? That's where we recorded it, uh, in at a place called uh, Feinstein's Fifty Four Below. Now that now that we have the album, live album, does that mean that we're going to see you on tour at all? Well, you know, um, I'm ho- I'm hoping to. You know, it's <laughs> it's very expensive to go on tour, <laughs> especially when you're playing little clubs, you know. <laughs> and so um, I, I'm I'm going to be putting out my autobiography in the spring, and so I'll be doing book signings, and hopefully there'll be a club I can play in as well. And um, you know, I just love singing. And I was always a singer, but then I'm, you know, inadvertently turned into a studio rat. And so I, I came out of the, the, that and, and decided, no, it's time for me to sing again. The book he's talking about is the book uh, Living on a Prayer. In, in, this, in this book, you're going to be relinquishing a lot of the stories connected to the songs. What is that like for you to be able to pour it out onto that computer screen? And then here come your, your readers, your followers. Well, the, the the book's going to be called "Living on a Prayer: Big Songs, Big Life," and I I co-wrote it over the last three and a half years with David Ritz, wow. and he's like one of the preeminent historians, uh, music historians, and so um, I just felt it was important to tell you know the story of the making of these you know, like amazing songs that really have become you know brands unto themselves and you know icons, the songs you know regardless of who sang them. And, um, you know, I just, um, it was very painful to go back and look at my childhood past and, you know, uh, rags to riches, uh, being Latino, being gay, you know, and overcoming all of those things to be able to be here in this amazing country and, and, uh, create, you know, what I have. Well, you've you've always had that. I don't want to call it a magical touch. How about a connection to the universe, to where you could hear things that other people couldn't, and you had the confidence and the courage to reach up there and grab it? I think that's the best way I've heard it put. You know, it's. I think that, you know, whether there's um, anything beyond what we are, I think that, uh, you know, there is mag- magnetism or, or electric connection between living things and maybe unliving things. And so I think with everything that's going on in the world, going into your senses, you know, into your, into your mind, it, 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 it collides with, you know, something inside, you know, and that explodes, that's creativity. And I've always been able to get in touch with that. And so uh, I, I try to inspire the artists that I work with to, to tap into that same energy. It's, it's like you're the, the, the conductor of an orchestra, the way that you bring people together. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they're that together <laughs> after I'm done with them. <laughs> See, now that's the reason why I can't wait to read the book, because you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna let us dive into those pages and get some stories. You know, I, last year I had the, the privilege and, and honor of working with my one of my all-time, you know, idols, Barbara Streisand. And um, she was wanting to uh, sing songs about, you know, what's going on in the world. And she made an album called Walls. Yep. And I wrote a song for her. I solely wrote it, which is very rare, called Lady Liberty. And um, it was, um, you know, one of the the most incredible experiences and you know going into the lion's you know den with like somebody as formidable and as strong as Barbara Streisand you know it, it was really challenging um and um you know she was you know very very nice to me and respectful because I think she loved the song so much yeah. and uh I had a terrific time working with her and you know I was like you know I just started pushing her you know to like reach up for those big notes and she's like you're a taskmaster you're a slave driver and then at the end you know she listened to the song it was put together and uh she gave me a big hug and she said you're a pain in the ass and i and then she said and i commend you (laughs) so uh, that's going on my tombstone man you know her quote (laughs) you got to come back to this show more and more in the future guy the backstage pass is always going to be here for you oh wow thank you 
I want my backstage pass <laughs> to be permanent. That's right. That's right. Be brilliant today, okay, Desmond? Thank you so much.